Amen. Oh, it is well. You know, I've heard Kevin tell the story of that song, uh, the writing of that song, I don't know, 50 times, I guess. He's told us that um, it is well was penned by a man who had lost his wife and two or three daughters across seas. He had gotten word and was on a boat going across seas. And when he got to the spot where the ship they were on had sank, that's where he penned those words. Now think about that. At the spot where he's lost everything, as far as he can see, he pins, it is well with my soul. My heavens, I hope you can say that this morning, no matter what you're facing, no matter what you're in the midst of, I hope you can honestly look at God and go, it is well with my soul. In other words, I trust you. I don't understand it. I don't know why. I don't, I don't get the whole story, but I trust you. It's probably not fair. It probably don't feel good, but I trust you. <laughs> my goodness. My goodness. 1 Peter chapter 4, if you would, turn in your Bibles with me. Um, Mr. Nathan and, and Mr. Mark will have uh, our scriptures coming up on the boards. There's going to be several of them this morning. If, in fact, I am able to stick to the plan that God has given me, um, I already see a scripture that I didn't give them. So you probably want to have your um, Bibles ready. 1 Peter chapter 4, starting in verse 1. We'll read six verses to begin with this morning. Therefore, since Christ suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same mind. For he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh for the lusts of men, but for the will of God. For we have spent enough of our past lifetime in doing the will of the Gentiles. When we walked in lewdness, lust, drunkenness, revelries, drinking parties, and abominable idolatries, in regard to these, they think it strange that you do not run with them in the same flood of dis dissipation, speaking evil of you. They will give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. For this reason, the gospel was preached also to those who are dead, that they might be judged according to men in the flesh, but live according to God in the Spirit. Let's pray. My Father and my God, I, I humble myself before you right now to say thank you for another opportunity to be uh, speaking your word. Father, I pray that you would be with us this morning, open our hearts and minds to your word, that you would hide me behind the cross, that you would seal up my opinions, Father, that your opinions would be what come out of my mouth. I pray that you continually supply me the words that need to be spoken to your body of believers this morning. Father, I, I ask you to continue to be with the families that are suffering loss, the, the Wells family, I pray for Kevin and um, his sisters, his mom, his, his family. I just pray for your um, guidance in their lives that you would continue to provide them a comfort and a peace that is beyond understanding. I pray for the Bostwick family this morning and, and their loss. I pray, Father, for your guidance in their lives. I pray again for that, that peace that surpasses all understanding. I ask, Father, that you continue to be with us throughout our services this morning, that you would continue to allow us to see and feel your presence in all that's said and done. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> First peeper. <laughs> we start that way, huh? First Peter, chapter 4, verse 1. Therefore... Since Christ suffered for us in the flesh, 
Christ suffered for us in the flesh. What did Christ possibly suffer for us in the flesh? Well, he suffered the same things that you and I suffer. Believe it or not, he, he has faced it all. He has seen it all. You do realize that Christ was rejected by his own family. He was an outcast from his family. You do realize that, that Christ was betrayed by one of his best friends. And the group of twelve, hurt came from that group. The person that he trusted betrayed him. You do know and understand and realize that he lost loved ones while he walked on this earth. You know, at one point in Scripture, Jesus wept. You know, when we talk about memorizing Scripture, that's the first one everybody wants to pop off. And my response is, if you can tell me why, I'll accept it. Anybody know why Jesus wept? Jesus wept because his friend died. He faced what you face. He knows what it feels like to be betrayed by somebody that you wouldn't expect to betray you. He knows what it feels like to suffer the loss of a loved one. He knows what it feels like to be rejected because of who you are. Christ faced what you face. He suffered in the flesh. He knows what it feels like. He understands where you're coming from. He faced it. He faced it in the flesh. Look at the next verse. Since Christ suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves. Arm yourself. Since Christ suffered, arm yourself. Arm yourself also with the same mind. Be ready. If Christ suffered in the flesh, you should expect to suffer. Right? Arm yourself with the same mind. Understand, if they did it to him, they're going to do it to you. If he was rejected, you'll be rejected. If he was betrayed, you'll be betrayed. If he suffered loss, you'll suffer loss. If he suffered, you're going to suffer. Arm yourself. Be prepared. Get ready. Don't be surprised when a person acts one way in this environment and this way in a different environment. Don't be surprised when the doctor says you have cancer. Don't be surprised when you get the call that your teenager isn't here anymore. He suffered. You're going to suffer. I'm going to suffer. Arm yourself. Be ready. Be ready to suffer. Expect it. Don't be surprised by it. Why are we so surprised that we suffer? You do realize we live in a broken creation, right? This place is cursed. This place is cursed. God put a curse on it. This earth is dying. And you're a part of this earth. You're dying too. Our days are numbered. We're going to suffer while we're here. Not might, not could, you will. So why are we so caught off guard by it? Listen, I'm not surprised by this. I know that in Scripture, Christ on three different occasions stood before 12 men. One of those was Judas, so we'll take the number to 11 because in the end, Judas wasn't still there. 11 guys, he stood in front of them on three different occasions and he told them this right here. I'm going to be handed over to evil men. I'm going to suffer. I'm going to be scourged and spat upon. And I'm going to die. But the third day, I will rise again. He told them that three times. Eleven men. How many of those men waited outside the grave of Jesus on the third day? Where were they at? What was their problem? Did they not believe him? Did they not hear him? He told them three times and he told them things in order and everything he said had taken place. Do you know what's even more surprising about that to me? When the ladies did go to the tomb and they came running back to some of those disciples, you know what their reaction was? No, uh That tomb ain't empty. 
Why did it not click with them? Why did they not get it? You know why? The same reason me and you ain't ready to suffer. We don't pay attention. We don't listen closely. And listen, these were the guys that walked with him as he done the miraculous things in his ministry. So if they can miss it, how much easier is it for you and I to miss it? That means we need to be on high alert. We need to be on high. When we read scriptures, we ought to be looking for this. Therefore, since Christ suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same mind. You're going to suffer too. Be ready. What does he mean by in the same mind? It means you've got to change your thought process. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Romans chapter 12, verses... This is the one I didn't give them, so don't expect it to pop up. Romans chapter 12, one, and I spent so much time trying to get it out. Like, back at it anyway. That dead gum Mark, I tell you what, he's irreplaceable. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Verse 2, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed. How? By the renewing of your mind. Why? Why renew your mind? That you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. You've got to change the way you think if you're going to be ready, if you're going to arm yourself. The first thing you've got to do is get your mind in the right place because your thoughts ain't God's thoughts. Your ways ain't His ways. You've got to get in sync with Him. We talked about it in Sunday school this morning. So many people want to take this and conform it to our lifestyle. We want to pick out the parts we like like a buffet and let the rest of it lay there. When the truth of the matter is, we're supposed to be conforming to this. We're supposed to be a reflection of this, not this a reflection of us. We're supposed to be a reflection of what this Word says. And if it tells me to arm myself, guess what I better be doing? I better be getting armed. I better be getting ready because suffering is coming. Why are we so surprised that we suffer in this world? That doesn't mean the tears don't flow. That doesn't mean it doesn't hurt. But we should almost be expecting it. Because it's going to happen in every one of our lives. It's going to happen, happen to us directly. It's going to happen to our children. It's going to happen to our parents. It's going to happen. It, it's go, we're living in a broken creation. This place is cursed. It's absolutely cursed. And we're surprised when the curse rears its ugly head. When people don't act like we think they ought to act, we're surprised. Arm your, you got to retrain the way you think. You got to get your mindset lined up with God's mindset. You got to get yourself in a place where you understand that God's got a lot bigger plan than you and I can ever see. It would scare us to death if He showed us His plan. We'd just stiffen up and fall over like an old stiff legged goat. Y'all have seen stiff-legged goats before, right? I was about 12, 13. I was riding four-wheelers with a couple of my cousins. It was four of us, me and my brother Thomas and my two cousins. We was riding back. We could leave their house at daylight and get back at dinner to refuel and get a sandwich and leave again and not come back until dark and not ride the same trail twice all day. We could ride. We had this one place we went down by, go down the road and then get on this little dirt road and there was this pasture full of goats. And my cousin gets going down through there wide open and he cut the engine off. I don't know if y'all ever rode. Don't do this because you can tear stuff up. You leave it in gear and don't hit the clutch or nothing. Turn the four-wheeler off. When you turn it back on, gas has built up inside the combustion chamber and when you throw that spark to it, it sounds like a cannon going off. Out the exhaust pipe, it'll go, pow! He did that. He did that. And when he did that, every goat in the field went. And I went, don't stop. You've killed every goat that man's got. And I mean, I, I can't get another gear going. 
Stiff leg. I mean, a hole. Can you picture a hole? It's about 75 goats, and they all went sideways <laughs> at one time. And he was dying laughing at me. Listen, you and I shouldn't have that reaction to the things when they hit us in this world. We shouldn't fall over like a field full of stiff-legged goats. We ought to be expecting it. Later on in life, this is a side note, later on in life we ended up with a couple of those goats at our house. That was the most fun me and my wife's had in a long time. <laughs> Every time I'd go outside, I'd clap my hands or squall out and they'd fall off. Hey, one of them was half stiff-legged. That meant his front side didn't lock up. <laughs> oh, it was good stuff. It was good stuff. Woo! My goodness, how'd y'all get me on that this morning? Forgive me, Lord. You got to be armed, to be ready for the sufferings of this world. That's funnier than a woman eating crayons out of revenge, Mary. <laughs> you got to change the way you think. You got to you got to retrain retrain the way you think. The second thing you got to do in order to be prepared in order to be ready is pray pray pray. Man, this is one of the most important things you and I can do as a Christian. It's one of the most underused weapons that a Christian has is prayer. We don't know how, we don't find time for it. It's not important to us. And I want to tell you something that's scary and sad. It's one of the greatest tools God has ever given us to be able to humble ourselves in front of Him and ask for whatever we need. And He go, okay. <laughs> but we don't do it. I can guarantee you this. God has never answered the prayer you didn't pray. You've got to pray it. You've got to verbalize it. Look at this. I want to show you how important um, prayer is according to Scripture. Mark 6, 46. <clears throat> Mark 6, 46 when he had sent them away, he departed to the mountain to pray. Jesus separated himself from other people to go off to a special place to pray. If Christ needed time alone with the Father, I'm going to guess I probably need some of that too. I'm going to have to have a time when I separate myself from everything else in life and just get with the Father and pray. This may be a devotional time, a daily time, a set-aside time, or it may be a time that it just happens sometimes and I'm able to make it happen. Take advantage of it. If Jesus needed time alone with the Father, so do I. Arm yourself. Be ready. Listen, you can't wait till it all hits and then start trying to get ready. You're behind. It'll be hard to get caught up. You've got to be ready ahead of time. I can point you to some folks that have faced some of the biggest challenges I could ever imagine. And I promise you, they'll tell you the only reason that they were able to get through some of these things is because they were ready ahead of time. They didn't, wasn't ready specifically for what was coming, but they knew they had to stay ready and their life was a display of preparing. Time in prayer, time in scripture, involved in the word, involved in church, surrounding yourself with like-minded believers. And then when the great big thing happened, when suffering took place, they weren't caught off guard. Now it wasn't that they were sitting and expecting the news that came their way. They just knew they had to always be ready. And let me tell you, you can't prepare enough <laughs> sometimes. Because they roll in one right after the other. They get on top of you. But if you're in a mindset, if you're in a place in your prayer life, then you can somewhat survive anyway. Matthew chapter 26, 36 to 46. Matthew, uh, Mark's going to have that up there for you, but I'm, I'm going to read it from my Bible because it's um, marked up and stuff. Matthew 26, starting in verse 36. Then Jesus came, to them to a place, came with them to a place called Gethsemane. And said to the disciples, sit here while I go and pray over there. And he took him, Peter, and two sons of Zebedee, and began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed. 
Then he said to them, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Stay here and watch with me. And he went a little further and he fell on his face and prayed, saying, O my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Then he came to the disciples and found them sleeping and said to Peter, What? Could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, a second time he went away and prayed, saying, O my father, if this cup cannot pass away from me unless I drink it, your will be done. And he came and found them asleep again, for their eyes were very heavy. So he left them, went away again, and prayed the third time, saying the same words. Then he came to his disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Behold, the hour is at hand. The Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. Jesus found it important to take his guys, his three, to go with him and pray. Now, they let him down a little bit. They, they was a little weak. Sometimes you need to separate yourself and pray. Sometimes you need to pray with folks and you need to have pray, folks praying with you and for you if you're going to be ready, if you're going to arm yourself, if you're going to be able to um, get through the sufferings that are no doubt in my mind coming your way if you're not in them right now. You need to be praying you need to be praying. You've got to change the way you think and you've got to be spending time in prayer. Some of that time by yourself, just you and God, and some of that time, look, this is the night before Jesus is going to be crucified. Do you see what an event he's facing? The night before, he's fixing to be betrayed. He's fixing to be handed over to evil men. And what does he spend his night doing? On his face praying with some other folks like-minded with him. Now we can talk about the failures of the other three, but I want you to see that Jesus reached out to like-minded brothers and said, please come pray with me. If he needed folks praying for him, how much more do I need folks praying for me? Luke chapter 22, 41 to 44. Luke 22, 41. Luke 22, 41 through 44. And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's throw, and he knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if it is your will, take this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Then an angel appeared to him from heaven, strengthening him. Oh, my. Have you ever... This is the same story we just read. This is the same account. This is the night of his betrayal. He's about to be crucified. And he goes about a stone's throw away from the guys that he brought with him. He kind of semi-separates himself and he hits his knees and look at what happened. When he began to pray, look at what happened. God sent an angel to strengthen in him. How many of you this morning would say, right now, God, I'd like to see that angel. Right now, I'd like to feel the strengthening so that I can get through what I'm standing in the middle of. Maybe I'm trying to make a tough decision. Maybe I'm facing some tough things at work. Maybe I'm facing some tough things at home. And right now, God, I'd just like to have some of your strength. You know how you access that? Get on your knees. Pray. 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 Sometimes we get convinced that the things in our lives are too small to bother God with. God wants to be involved in absolutely every single aspect of your life. He wants to be involved in where you park at Walmart. He wants to be involved in every... At nothing you talk to Him about is too small for Him. He wants to be involved in the little stuff so when the big stuff comes, you ain't talking to a stranger. If you 
Go back and read the story of David and Goliath, one of my favorites. You'll see that when David stepped up, he was a little guy. He's facing Goliath, who's a giant. And everybody goes, Cuz, you ain't got a chance. But if you want to go try this, we're going to let you. So they start taking armor off of folks and putting it on David. They gave him a big old floppy helmet that was too big. They gave him a shield he could barely tote. They even tried to strap a sword on him and it was dragging the ground. And he shook all that stuff off of him. And you know what he said? These are weapons I've never tried. I'm not familiar with these. Give me my sling, give me my rocks, and I'll show you. Were those other weapons adequate weapons for what was fighting? Yeah, they were. They were. But you know what? They were untested. David knew there was no way he could go to battle with untested weapons. And we do it every day. We do it every day. God wants to be involved in the little stuff. So when the big stuff hits, you ain't talking to a stranger. He don't want you going to battle with untested weapons. He gave you his word so you can spend time in it. So when there is no crisis, you can sit with it and understand what it says. So when there is a crisis, it don't look like it's written in a, written in a foreign language to you. Make habits of these things. Be prepared. Arm yourself. You've got to change the way you think and you have got to pray. You've got to pray. The next thing. You've got to know where your hope is. You've got to know where your hope is. <clears throat> a lot of times our hope is in things of this world. A lot of times our, th our hope is in physical stuff. Our hope is in a job. Our hope is in a dollar. Our hope is in a person. And every one of those things will let you down. And you know what? It's most likely they're going to let you down when you need them the most. That's how you know they let you down, right? You was leaning on them when they fell. Then you fell. You've got to know where your hope is. So where is your hope? Romans 8, 23 and 25. Romans 8, 23 to 25. Not only that, but we also who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the, op the adoption of... The redemption of our body. Verse 24. For we were saved in this hope. We were saved in this hope. But hope that is seen is not hope. Hope that is seen is not hope. If you can physically touch it, that's not where you put your hope. You can already test it and see what it is. That's not hope. Hope. For why does one still hope for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it in perseverance. Your hope is not in physical stuff. If you're hoping for something in this world to rescue you, you're going to be let down. Why would you hope for something you can see? We hope for the return of Christ. <laughs> Our hope is that Christ is who He says He is, the Son of God. Some religions tell us that they will not deny Jesus' existence. It's a historical fact the man walked this earth. But they'll call Him a good teacher. They'll call Him a good prophet. I'll say this. He's either exactly who He says He is or He's a liar. And a liar can't be a good teacher. Because he himself said, I am the Son of God. So he's either exactly, and that's our hope, is that Jesus is exactly who he says he is. Because we serve a God that can't go against his own word. He can't break his promises. As a matter of fact, his desire is to fulfill every promise he ever made in every one of his children. Then our hope is Jesus is who he says he is. The Son of the one that can't make break promises. And that he is coming back to get his church. That's our hope. Because if your hope is for things of this world, it's going to let you down. Why you hope for things you can see? Now, now this hope isn't a faint hope. It's, this isn't a, I hear the ice cream truck, I hope he comes down my street. No, this is a blessed assurance. This is a you can know beyond a shadow of a doubt kind of hope. This is a guaranteed kind of hope. 
That's where your hope is. 1 Corinthians 15, 12 through 19. 1 Corinthians 15, 12 through 19. 1 Corinthians 15, 12 through 19. Even so, you, since you are zealous for spiritual gifts, let it be for the edification of the church that you seek to excel. I'm in the wrong verse. One more page and I'd have been with y'all. See, I didn't study good enough, did I? 1 Corinthians 15, 12. Now, if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty and your faith is also empty. Here's where your faith's at, is in the resurrection of Christ. It's our hope. <clears throat> yes, and we are found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that He raised up Christ whom He did not raise up. If, in fact, the dead do not rise. For if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ. Listen to this. If in this life only we have hope in Christ. If your only hope is in this world. If in this world only we have hope in Christ. We are of all men most pitiable. If you know what you know about Christ. If you a believer of Christ, a follower of Jesus Christ, a child of God, and your hope is anchored in this world, then you of all men are most pitiable. It's sad for you to know what you know about Christ and for your hope to be only in Him and the things of this world. If you don't know and understand that there's life after this, that this ain't the best there is, then you of all men are most pitiable. Wow, that's a huge statement. I didn't make that up. That ain't Baptist doctrine. That comes straight from the Word of God. He wants you to know that this morning. Your hope cannot be in these things. Look at this. 1 Timothy 1.1 1, 1. Oh, when I looked up hope, I, I, mm, I spent a lot of time reading scriptures about hope. <clears throat> There's a ton of them. I didn't write them all down just to save y'all a little time this morning. 1 Timothy 1.1, 1, 1, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the commandment of God our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ. What does he call him? Our hope. He's just addressing a letter to Timothy. And in it he goes... I'm writing to you in the name of Jesus Christ, our hope. Christ is your hope, not the things of this world, not the relationships of this world, not the jobs of this world, the people, not even the preacher. If your hope's in me, you're going to, I'm going to let you down. Uh, probably more than once. <laughs> Some of you I already have. Don't put your hope in the stuff in this world. You'll never be prepared. You'll never be armed to face the sufferings that are coming your way if your hope is in anything besides Christ himself. Amen. You can't be. You can't be. You're going to get your feelings hurt worse than they already are. Hebrews 6, 13 to 20. Oh, this is one of my favorites. For when God made a promise to Abraham because he could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself. Think of that. When, when we make a promise to somebody, we, we make it based on authority coming from somewhere else, right? Nobody's greater than God, so he swore by himself. That's awesome. Saying, surely blessing, I will bless you, and multiplying, I will multiply you. And also, after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. For men indeed swear by the greater, and an oath for confirmation is for them an end of all dispute. Thus God, determining to show more abundantly the, 
to the heirs of promise, the immutability of his counsel confirmed it by an oath, by two immutable things in which it is impossible for God to lie. It is impossible for God to lie. We might have strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold of the hope that is set before us. This hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which enters the presence, enters the presence behind the veil. Stop, don't, don't go back, Mark. This hope we have as an anchor of the soul. An anchor of the soul, both sure and and steadfast. It's immovable. In other words, if you have this hope, if you're, if you're attached to the hope that the Bible speaks of, then the trials of this word can't sway, of this world can't sway you. The sufferings of this world can't sway you. If you're a faithful man when the sun's shining, you'll be a faithful man when it's thunderstorming. If you're a faithful man when the boat is still, then you'll be a faithful man when the, when the, when the waves are big. Arm yourself. Arm yourself. You've got to get your mind right. You've got to spend time in prayer. You've got to know your hope. Man, this hope is an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast. It's not going to move. So if you're tied to it, guess what? You won't move either. But when you're anchored to something besides this hope, you're going to be swished and swashed and washed and tossed all over this world. There's nothing continuous about this world except for the fact that it's not steadfast. <laughs> If you don't believe that, look at the trends just you can remember. About the time you got your afro growed out. About the time you saved up the money to get you some bell bottoms. Everybody else ain't wearing them no more. Right? These fads come and go. The things of this world are ever-changing. It's not solid. It's not steadfast. It's, it's moving so fast you can't stay with it. And then you wake up one day and you're so confused you look like Shaggy over here. <laughs> Poor thing. He wasn't expecting that. <laughs> sorry, Austin. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, man. Please forgive me. Go with me to, uh, let's, let's go to 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 12 and 13. And I know I skipped one on you, Mark, but we're going we're gonna to let that be it. 1 Peter chapter 4, 12 and 13. Listen, in verse, chapter 4, verse 1, Therefore, since Christ suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same mind. For he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased, he suffered in the flesh. On our behalf. And if he suffered, you're going to suffer. Look at this, verse 12. Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing has happened to you. Don't look at your trial and think you special. <laughs> that ain't strange, it's normal. For a Christian to suffer is normal. Now, I know you probably weren't told that when you signed up for this. Me neither. <laughs> that ain't the way it's taught, is it? No, you know what we're told? Oh, just come be a child of God. Just come accept Christ and everything's going to be all right. Hogwash. It's not going to be all right. It's going to be hard. Matter of fact, it's going to be harder on you then than it was when you weren't a Christian. Because when you weren't a Christian, you didn't have no boundaries, you didn't have no standards, you didn't have no rules. Now you do. So it's not going to be easier, it's going to be tougher because these trials are coming. These sufferings are coming. It's not if, but when. 
It's going to hurt. I promise you, it hurts to the core. And as a matter of fact, it ain't fair. <laughs> but don't think you're special. <laughs> it's coming for all of us. Don't look at it as some strange thing has happened to you. It's normal. It's who God is. It's who God's children are. Listen, his whole thing is to put us here and show us how bad we need him. Right? It's to make us to long for something greater than this. If this was comfortable, why would you long for heaven? Right? This ain't good because he wa wants you to know there's something better for you. He don't want you to be comfortable. You're pilgrims here. You're just passing through. It's only for a time. According to Scripture, life is but a vapor. It's temporary. So why are we so attached to it? Why do we love it so much? Why are we so surprised that people mistreat us? Why are we so surprised that even as Christians we hurt? Listen, don't think it's strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you. Look, but rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's suffering. That when His glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. See, there, there's more to than what we're seeing here. This is temporary. Our joy is in the things to come. Now, does that mean we have to walk around with our lip poked out and sad about everything all the time? No. If you do that, don't nobody want what you got. Y'all ever made the mistake and asked somebody how they're doing and they told you? And you went, hey, hey, I was just trying to be nice. <laughs> I, a lot of those folks are Christians. Oh, me. <laughs> and you just avoid them and go, whatever you do, don't ask her how she's doing because she's going to tell you. <laughs> and we ain't got time for all that. <laughs> Why? You ain't got to be sad. This, this suffering doesn't mean that we're some kind of failures or losers. I've read the back of the book. We win. <laughs> we should be excited about that victory. See, our hope isn't in the things of this world because the things of this world are deteriorating. They're falling apart right out from and under you. By the time you get your afro grow, everybody's wearing some other cut. Don't get caught up in the things of this world to the point that you lose sight of what's most important. Don't be surprised that people mistreat you. They mistreat me too. Rejoice in it to the point that you got to partake in the sufferings of Christ. In other words, you're able to stand by Christ and go, you know that time you suffered for loss? I suffered that too. You know that time they, your friends betrayed you? They betrayed me too. Y'all see that? You, you feel that? Do you understand that? It's actually a badge of honor and we look at it as shame. It's actually a badge of courage and we look at it as shame. See, society's messed up the way we think. They give their badge of courage to a guy that can't decide if he wants to be a boy or a girl. They did. They celebrate what God says is evil. And if we ain't careful, we'll be over in the corner going... Oh, me is right. We do. See, our society has got our mindset twisted. Arm yourself. And if you want to be ready, here's what you've got to do. This isn't a complete list, but this is a good place to start. You've got to change your thought process. You've got to renew the way you renew your mind. You've got to change the way you think. You've got to pray, pray, pray. You've got to pray, pray, pray. You've got to know your hope. And you can't think it's strange. You can't think it's strange. You've got to be able to view suffering as normalcy and go, you know what? This is a broken, fallen creation and this is part of it. It stinks. I'm not a fan of it. Some days it just ain't fair. But I'm just going to trust God while I get through this thing. I'm going to hold on to my hope as my anchor. I'm going to pray like I've been praying. I'm going to change the way I'm thinking about this thing. 
Make sure that God gets glory when I get to the other side. Amen. Amen. Y'all pray with me. Father and our God, we do again humble ourselves before you to say thank you for another opportunity to be gathered in your house. We thank you, Father, that we do this in a country where we don't fear for our lives. Father, we pray for those that can't say that this morning and ask that you be with them. Comfort them. Bring them peace that surpasses all understanding. Father, right now I pray that if there's one here today that everything I said was foreign to them because they don't recognize your hope, they don't recognize your word, they don't have a prayer life because they're not a child of yours, I pray that they'd be so uncomfortable they can't help but step out into that aisle. Father, I pray for salvation for those that don't have it. And I pray, Father, that if there's one here this morning, if there's 50 here this morning, if everybody in here this morning can understand that trials ain't strange to us. Father, I pray that you give us the strength to get in this altar this morning and cry out to you, whether it be for ourselves or on behalf of somebody else. Father, I thank you and I love you. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.